can you walk us through being detained by the Taliban? I'm not a spy. I'm not there doing anything illegally and just hope that eventually uh, the right person can come and vouch for you. And that was a little bit difficult. Love and light, everybody. And welcome back to another episode of El Podcast, the greatest virtual happy hour in the world. I am your host, Kai Primo, and I am joined by Jesse Wright. Today, we have a special episode, but before we get into the world of war journalism, please subscribe on YouTube and also find us on Spotify as well as Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We deeply appreciate all of you and cheers. It's happy hour. Today, we are joined by Holly McKay. Holly is a foreign policy expert, freelance journalist, war crimes investigator, and a humanitarian. She was an investigative and international affairs war journalist for Fox News Digital for over 14 years, focusing on warfare and crimes against humanity. She is a best-selling author of the book, Only Cry for the Living, Memos from Inside the ISIS Battlefield. So this is a, a very, very deep episode, and uh, uh, and Holly, uh, you are probably one of the most interesting and incredible human beings I've ever met. And in your experiences and your work, you know, telling stories and war and terrorism, these experiences are experiences that that normal people would wish never to experience. But yet you do it, and we're so honored to have you with us today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Now you were a you were into ballet. You're a ballerina. It's such a, a, a crazy contrast. How do you go from mm -hmm. being a ballerina to being a war journalist? I studied sort of ballet all my life, and when I was very young, I went away to a boarding school that sort of focuses on performing arts, um, which was a really beautiful experience, and. I broke my ankle at 18, so that sort of squashed some opportunities that I had. Um, lucky, you know, I'd always studied, so I, I did have university as a backup. But um, so I went home back to Sydney and I enrolled in uh, UTS in University of Technology in Sydney. I got really bored sort of through it and I continued to dance pretty much. So I'd go to night class sort of very dismissed. <laughs> I wasn't really the probably the best student. And I still worked a lot dancing during the day and taking different jobs and things like that. So I sort of had a foot in each door. Um, and then I had an opportunity as I was finishing my degree um, that my university was affiliated with the University on Wall Street, New York. Um, and I really wanted to get out and travel and I'd saved up sort of all my own money from the work that I'd done. So it wasn't that I, you know, needed a loan or my parents' permission. So off I went and um, I ended up getting an internship at Fox. I didn't even know what an internship was. Um, I'd always loved to write and was sort of that annoying child that was always writing stories and reading. So I definitely had that part of me, but I don't know that I ever really considered journalism itself as a career. And so I ended up, you know, doing this internship and because I'd had a little bit of web sort of coding experience, and this is 2006, so it's very much the beginning of this sort of digital era of news. At that point, people were still really getting stories from the television and, and from very sort of a conventional uh, streams. So this was a chance to be part of sort of this new thing. And, um, and it was just very fortunate timing because they were looking for somebody that was young, that could, you know, I was uh, 20, just turned 21, um, could go to, you know, all these different places and get stories and sort of had this sort of tenaciousness. So I ended up getting sponsored and hired by Fox and moved to LA. And that's sort of um, was baptism by fire, really, because I sort of had my own column and suddenly had to really, I didn't know anybody and I never had formal journalism training. So um, it was very much um, just sort of throw to the sharks and figure it out. And, um, and I kind of had to do that. And as I learned about different uh, stories and, and was covering different themes and sort of had um, my hand in, in different areas, I was really fascinated by the world stuff. I'd learned to speak a little bit of Arabic growing up just because of um, there was a big Lebanese community around where I grew up. Um, and I was just very curious. And I think that is always the number one thing is you just have to be curious. You have to want to be in a place, to understand a place, um, and be willing to really go that extra mile. And so I, I traveled a bit and I sort of started doing work in the Middle East and just really immediately fell in love with it. And 
yeah, couldn't imagine doing anything else with my life. So you're in LA um, working for Fox. Can you walk us through your first assignment in a conflict zone? What was that like for you? And they brought you into the office or did they bring you to an office or did you pitch the idea? Like walk us through that um, experience, I guess. I mean, there was sort of multiple conflict zones that I was in, but the first that I actually was really doing a lot of writing about, um, that was in the, uh, I guess the, the outgrowth of the war that was happening um, in Israel-Palestine in 2014. Um, that was the one that I really started to cover a lot. And then from there, Iraq. I think for me, I always really applied the skills that I had as a journalist, regardless of the topic that I was doing. Um, and it just happened to be in a little bit more of a challenging zone. But I definitely didn't change the way that I approach a story, which is to make sure that as many sides are covered as possible um, to sort of make sure that your that your copy is clean. There's you know, something as basic as that to make sure that um, what you're reporting is as accurate to the best of your ability. And then to really bring the human side into it, to talk to people on the streets, to um, you know, talk to officials, to talk to just as many, get as many perspectives as possible. And um, then obviously you have the the extra layer of trying to be safe in a war zone too. And that um, you know that it requires basically. Good instinct, as crazy as that sounds, and also really relying on locals, talking to your driver, talking to the people at the hotel, um, talking to all the people that are much, much more experienced than you are and understanding where they're going, what they're doing, and um, and kind of taking it for there. And then I guess from that conflict, I went to Iraq um, and that was, you know, that was sort of a different beast. That, um, that was a much more broad scale. Um, that was... You know, again, I was relying on people that I knew and context that I had, and I still do that to this day. Um, you're very much putting your trust into local people, essentially, to kind of get you around, to get you to where you need to be. And and I remember sort of getting there and and through a contact, um, you know, I was driven sort of south toward this front line, and, and that was sort of my first experience really being on a front line, which um, was was, yeah, pretty much straight away. Um, and feeling very, uh, what's the word? Kind of confident being there. Not confident in an, I hope not in an arrogant way, but confident in, I wasn't rattled by the situation. I listened to orders. I didn't panic. And, and I think those are important skills to have um, in those sort of dramatic environments is you've got to really be able to sort of keep your head on about things. And I think for me, um, I just felt, comfortable in these uncomfortable situations. And that sort of was a, a prod to me to keep pursuing um, these sorts of stories that I found to be just fascinating. I think that's why I've been such a big fan is because you have this, you know, you have a way to, to stay calm and stay relaxed. Was that just your upbringing or your, your nature and like, I mean, I think as an Australian, we generally are a pretty laid back kind of people anyway. Add a few, yeah, missiles and rockets in there, and you know most people probably wouldn't be so calm. Um, but there is a trade-off to it. And I say that because yes, I can be very calm in in challenging sort of situations. But I did find, and I think I have much more of a grip on it now. But I did find, especially you know through my first few years of doing this work, that I would come back and absolutely just freak out and have a meltdown about stupid things. Um, the bills that had to be paid, I remember one time coming back from, I think it was Iraq or Syria, and I was with a friend in D.C. and uh, staying in D.C. In a, in a hotel, and I, the zipper on, it was winter, and the zipper on my shoe broke. And I had to run to a meeting, an important meeting, and I had no shoes to wear except for my running shoes. And um, I just remember having an absolute meltdown over it, just like it was the end of the world. So I think there is a little bit of a trade-off that you, um, when you do sort of have that sense of calmness, sometimes that can it can almost backfire in, in, a, in a silly way. And, and it's a, yeah, we all have to be aware of those things, I think, and um, do what we can to kind of fix them. and. Uh, yeah, I've had to do a lot of work on that. So it's just, it's sort of funny how it's so interesting. It manifests itself. It has to make an exit some, at some point. I think we had a conversation in Washington, D.C., where it's like you would panic, you know, over, like we said, the little things. But I think it's just probably the stuff you've already was the intake Accumulated. of traumatic experience. Yeah. yeah. 
And then it's just coming out in that way. Um, we're super, so Jesse and I were talking about like, how do we prepare for this? But we are super curious, like logistically of how this works. What's the planning pros process like when you're about to go to these these places, the permits, all that stuff. Like, how do you prepare? Yeah, I mean, each place is very individual and each trip itself is very individual. So um, there isn't one sort of rhyme or reason. Some places like Afghanistan, you have to get a visa for. And so, you know, you have to apply different visas, a little more challenging now with the Taliban because you have to go to Dubai to kind of get it or to Istanbul. But previously you could go to any of the consulates or embassies and, and sort of you had to put together a file of your work and a letter and, you know, all kinds of things and, and buy a visa um, that would give you permission to work for how, whatever length of time. And then, you know, with, with Afghanistan, even now under the Taliban, you can fly into Afghanistan. So that does make life a little bit easier. You can, with the visa, you can get a flight to Kabul, you know, from Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Doha or whatever connecting city it may be. Um, but then you have other places that you can't just sort of get up and fly into that aren't so easy. Uh, Ukraine now being one of them. I mean, it's a, it's a very sort of challenging, it's not challenging in that you need a visa as an Australian or American, but you know, usually the last trip that I did was you fly to Krakow in Poland and then you have to drive to Kiev. Um, and then, you know, you cross the border, which is about, it's about four hours, I think from Krakow to the border and you get stamped across the border. And then you have to have a trustworthy person that's going to drive you another 12 hours to Kiev. And then for me, because my, my work is focused in the East, which is sort of the brunt of the battle, um, then it's another 12 hours of, you know, blown up roads of being, so you're sort of relying on referrals really for, for drivers and, and paying locals to kind of take you places. And um, so it is very, um, it, is, it is sort of challenging logistically in a very different way. But, you know, even in a place that you can sort of fly into or get into, getting around is, is certainly not easy. Afghanistan, you, you know, you need to, again, it's all, I'm a big proponent of, it's all about those trusted local people that you're with. And I've never worked with security. I know a lot of the big networks and TV crews they go around with, with security guards and things. I've never, never done that. Um, so my approach is much more under the radar and I'm really, I'm the person who's in charge of my security and logistics. And I, and I usually always That's have crazy. a local sort of fixer with me who a fixer is somebody journalists use. They sort of, um, in a way, they're kind of like a producer. They, right. they interpret for you, but they also, you know, help set up meetings and help you kind of, um, get the things that you need to put a story together. And they're really vital. And, um, I find that I, in all these different countries I work, I, I grow very close to my fixes and they become really like, you know, extensions of my family. And, um, I really rely on them to, you know, help me get the, the best driver that, that, um, knows what to say at the checkpoint and, um, to kind of help me navigate some of those, uh, security issues. And it's, of course, it's not perfect and they're always working at very high risk to themselves. Um, but I, yeah, I'm really a proponent of, of just finding trustworthy people on the ground that can help you kind of navigate uh, the different scenarios. Do you have communications with the fixer prior to leaving as far as like, oh, yes. you know, telling them to it's find? So yeah. It's usually, yeah. So you tell them who to find or? I usually give them sort of an idea about what stories maybe it is that I want to pursue. I mean, I listen to them if they have any sort of stories that they, you know, think is, is worthy. And I always have a rough idea of a couple of stories or angles that I kind of want to take on something. And I think that's important to kind of have that in your mind, to research that, to, um, to kind of have a good base of knowledge going into to that. But then at the same time, you also have to be extremely open-minded to whatever stories you're going to find on the ground. And you're always going to find something that jumps out at you when you're there that you never read in a story or that you can never possibly read from a textbook. Um, so I think it's important to, to be able to balance both those things. And so, yeah, when you're there, things may come up and then, you know, have that discussion with my fixer and be like, do we have time to do X, Y, Z? You know, is that a possibility? Can we go here? Um, and then you kind of um, let things sort of flow a little bit from there. So it's always uh, it's always a juggling act um, because I'm usually not going in for one story. I'm usually going in yeah. for at least a few, um, depending on the length of time that I'm spending in a certain place. You've interviewed all walks of life, all kinds of people, including war criminals and you know people with extremist ideologies. How do you 
have their trust so that they would sit with you to even do the interview in the, in the first place? Again, it's very individual. Sometimes it's, you know, you have to chit chat with this person for X amount of months or weeks or whatever it is in advance to kind of get to know them, to ask about their families. Um, and that's sort of a very different level. I think that trust is, you just have to really be honest too. I think that, um, you know, I don't try to be undercover or try to tell people I'm something I'm not. Um, I think it's very important to just be very forthright about being, being a journalist, what you do, um, what your gender is. And, and I think for me, and every journalist is different. I generally, you know, I'm, I'm having more of a conversation than I am having an interrogation session. So it's not really my job to you know, stick it to somebody and tell them what's right and what's wrong. What I find much more interesting, and of course you, you pull people up when, you, when they're saying something that's completely egregious. It's important to listen, uh, very important to listen. And I think, you know, that's a big part of sort of how I approach these particular conversations. Um, is to listen and to just sort of try to tap into what they're thinking, why they do what they do, um, what's going on in their brain. And I think that we can only kind of begin to combat that once we understand it. And unfortunately, I think there is just so much of a tendency to not want to really understand it um, or to see it as, you know, giving an evil person a platform. But I definitely don't see it that way. I see it as um, a really important part of being a journalist is that sort of dark side of journalism. I can only imagine, like, <laughs> picture you sitting and uh, maybe interviewing, like, you know, someone who's a member of ISIS or, um, is it, is this nerve wracking for you? Like before you sit down or really you're just cool, calm, collected and, and you know, it's, it's sincere. I think there's always a little bit of healthy nerves. And again, it depends a little bit on the circumstances where I'm interviewing them and, you know, are they in captivity? Are they in the wild? You know what? Um, so there, you know, there are different factors and I think it's always important to, to have, um, just, you know, a healthy sense of nerves that show that you, that you care. Um, but I think it's also important to be um, sort of calm and, and collected in the interview. You certainly don't want to come across as being rattled or, or panicked or, or anything like that. You know, you can't be too emotional either. Um, and, you know, that I've had that problem with interpreters and things before where they'll get very upset or very emotional about a situation or very angry at the subject and, and, you know, I've had to ask them to like step outside for a minute because that's not helping me. So it is, it is hard, I think, especially for locals that are often so close to the situation that have lost loved ones, you know, to be able to sort of separate themselves, um, during that, that period. But, um, but I, I do think, um, you want the situation to kind of be as calm as possible when you're going into it and you want them to trust you to, um, understand that whatever they say, you know, is it going to be misconstrued regardless of who the subject is and, and to sort of have that integrity and honesty. Um, and again, it's, it's always your word against mine, but the best thing that you can do is, yeah, is to just listen. And I think we forget that oftentimes, especially in journalism, just the, the real importance of, of paying attention and not looking at your notebook and seeing what questions you have next or, or anything like that too much and just listening so that you don't miss, um, something that's, that's really important. You've been in conflict zones in Europe and Latin America, Africa and Southeast Asia, just to name a few different places. How close is the, what the mainstream media reports on to like actually being there and experiencing, experiencing it for yourself? Like, is, is it fairly accurate? It's so hard to paint things with a broad brush. I think again, you know, there are so many media outlets. Um, everybody's going to have a, a somewhat different take, and that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, it just means that it's a different story or a different perspective. Um, so again, it's it's very hard to always know um, exactly what's sort of coming in and out. And I think that's really important then to sort of be able to read multiple articles and and sort of figure out um, sort of some semblance of it, what's going on. But but we're all humans and everybody's going to view a situation very differently. And I, I know the mainstream media gets maligned a lot. And certainly there are many egreg egregious examples of that, particularly in domestic reporting, really, to be honest, haven't been particularly um, sort of fair and balanced. I think when it comes to foreign reporting, it's, it's such a sort of a select group of people that, that do this sort of work. It's not easy to do the kind of work. So 
I think for the people that actually on the ground, um, they'll often, you know, have a sort of very interesting and, and generally truthful takes on, on what is happening. The problem I see is when mainstream reporting or these sort of quote unquote pundits and experts report on a matter when they're not actually there or they don't sort of have the depth of knowledge. And that's when I see a lot of, um, misinformation kind of getting floated around um, and that's purely for a lack of really just being on the ground or or simply just relying on one source that's telling you something um, there is still there's so much to be said for that ground reporting um, I think that unfortunately a lot of it's been lost just in news budgets and attention driven elsewhere um, but I, I just think it's it's so important and people think that they can get everything in real time now because of social media but you don't really have anyone there to vet the information you don't have anyone there to even tell you that that okay well that came from um, a battlefield in Kharkiv when it might actually be footage from Syria uh, six years ago. So I think that's really important to, to sort of have have uh, journalists that are able to kind of weed through a little bit of that information instead of just relying on whatever raw images and photos are being put out on social media. It's hard to know. I, I, it's really hard to know. It's like, how do you know what's the truth and what's not too, though, you know? Um, that's it's hard to do. It's hard to do. The cover of the book um, only cry for the living. Um, what's the story of the cover? So that is actually wreckage um, from Mosul, um, which was um, a place that ISIS had uh, controlled for a really long time. It really it suffered the brunt. Um, it's Iraq's second largest city, and it really suffered the brunt of the conflict in that way. And um, yeah, I mean, the devastation in the old city was just, it's profound. You know, it was just, it was absolutely the apocalypse. Um, and that was really you know, urban fighting and the U.S. sort of led coalition with the Iraqis really didn't have, um, I guess, a great amount of choice other than to, to pretty much decimate the area to to get rid of ISIS from the area. But there's a line in the book that's um, a victory sometimes resembles an apocalypse. And that's really, you know, that came from Mosul because that's what, that's what you know, that's what Mosul was. It, it just um, really... This sort of devastation that's hard to imagine and um that a cover image and, and of course the people leaving is um, is featured on the cover what is it like there now do you know of, of i know you've been doing a lot of work in the ukraine but um uh in mosul and uh in afghanistan like are they rebuilding or are things like what's the update i guess yeah i mean it's still it's still tough uh, in iraq i mean i was in baghdad earlier this year um, you know, mm -hmm. still, it's hard rebuilding. It's, it's a, a lot of it is still very damaged. People can't go home. Um, you know, there just isn't the funding there to just kind of rebuild entire cities and villages. Um, so there are still camps. People are still living in these camps. They've been living in for, you know, eight years in some cases. And you can imagine these tents are no longer being changed out. So um, you can imagine their, their living situation now is far worse than it was even in the, the sort of the height of the war because when it's the height of the war, there's uh, the UN and there's all these NGOs and there's a lot of attention and media attention and people are donating and um, so that, they, you know, people can get aid and things that they need. But once that attention goes away um, and people move their attention somewhere else, it doesn't mean that that conflict has gone away or that humanitarian crisis has gone away, that their people are still there and they're still suffering. Um, and now they're suffering even more because of that lack of attention. Um, so it's certainly, um, there are sort of many ripple effects, I think, from war. So many stateless children because they were born to ISIS fathers and therefore they're not recognized by the Iraqi government, um, just, you know, and the Syrian government as well. So there's many things like that that are just uh, many of uh, women, these 80 women, that were taken as sex slaves that, and now that they're, um, if they had a child, they're sort of um, blacklisted from society, if you will, um, whereas the Yazidi community will take back the women, but they won't take the child. And it, there's just many, many ripples and complications and, um, you know, still fighting for power. There are still ISIS cells that operate. Um, there are still bombing. So it's certainly not to the, the large war scale that it was, Um you know, five years ago, but it is, it is just, you know, it's still pretty horrific in that um, the aftermath is, is, there's just so many, so many things that happen in that aftermath that we, we can't really wrap our heads around, um, but they still go on. And, and sadly, they just sort of go on very much in darkness. 
with Afghanistan, it was, um, you know, it was a lot less ruined than Iraq or other places uh, or Syria. It was, um, you know, you had villages and things that were certainly bombed, but there wasn't sort of the large scale bombing and destruction in, in the major cities. Um, so from that perspective, um, you know, things have been able to kind of relatively turn to normal. Um, but again, you know, you've got a Taliban government, you've got, um, and all the implications that come with that, whether it's women's education, or um, dress rulings, or just it's a completely different sort of way of life, I think, for a lot of people, especially those living in cities. Um, and there's so much to adapt to. You've got sort of the financial crisis that comes with a government being, um, you know, ousted and, and having all their assets and funds frozen. So there is the humanitarian crisis, there's the lack of food, there's the lack of medicine, there's all sorts of things that, that happen that we don't really hear about because our attention goes elsewhere. Yeah. Who's who's out there helping? Are there many NGOs that's out there? You know, certainly in Afghanistan, um, there were many, many NGOs during the time of the war and, and go into sort of different analogies of that because that was a, a bit of a corrupt cash cow in itself. I'm on the board of one called Emergency that has a lot of clinics and hospitals uh, throughout the country. They've been been there in Afghanistan since the last Taliban rule in the 90s. So, um, you know, they um, have already already sort of had, a, a, I guess, a relationship with the Taliban. So, you know, the Taliban appreciates them being there uh, because the Taliban knows that, you know, if these hospitals and clinics leave, the country's going to fall apart even more. Um, so you have um, sort of the big NGOs. You still have got ICRC, um, who has sort of a, an amazing um, prosthetics clinic there. Um, okay. They make prosthetics yeah. for for you know, many, many Afghans who sadly lose their limbs in, in the endless uh, landmines. They also are funding a maternity hospital there since when the government was stopped being able to fund it when the fall happened, you know, ICRC uh, were able to sort of come in and, and step up. So that was, you know, something that was hugely valuable. So there are some of the sort of um, major NGOs that still operate, but um, usually on, on fairly shoestring budgets and, and with a lot more caveats than before. So um, it's there, but but definitely nothing like it used to be. Yeah, and I would imagine it's probably not enough that, you know, that things are moving fast. Uh, I wonder, do you feel like, um, do you see like a peaceful, you know, Afghanistan where, you know, things are kind of, you know, just uh, I mean, you may normalcy. see, you know, uh, what I mean, you already see a slightly less, um, you know, suicide bombings and conflicts because the Taliban isn't doing that anymore. You still have ISIS and other factions, but, you know, to the degree of, of sort of war that was happening, I think you can you could say that it's definitely less than. But, uh, but you know, the, the problems that arise are different. Um, again, it's, you know, women haven't been able to go to school for 18 months. You've got... Um, uh, just, you know, a very, very sort of strict um, Sharia law being implemented. So the, the problems change. And, and while it may sort of seem on the surface to be peaceful, uh, you know, as we see it, um, you know, there are a lot of other issues that Afghans now have to tackle. You know, you're amongst people that are in constant survival mode, while, when, you know, while you were there in Iraq and Afghanistan. Are you placed in a position where they're begging you for help or to get them out of there in any way or? All the time in Afghanistan, constantly. Um, what do you do? Yeah, people like, constantly barrage you for help to get out really is the main thing there. Like, how do you tell them, I guess, like when you, there's nothing yeah. you can do to help? It's always difficult and it's always hard when people are, are in, um, you know, frantic mode and are struggling. But I think, you know, I, I just have to be honest. I, I definitely don't say that I can do something that I can't. And, you know, in the past, especially in the beginning, I certainly, you know, did my best to sort of try to help refer people to people that were uh, in much more of a position to just kind of handle evacuations and other things. For me, I have to recognize that my job as a journalist, my job is to tell your story, um, and I can't do anything sort of beyond that. And I've had to be very firm and clear in that stance. Um, again, which is hard, but to, to be really like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that you're going through this, but, you know, my job is not to evacuate. My job is to to tell stories. And, and that is why I'm here and what I'm here to do. Um, you know, whether that 
you know, your story ends up being part of the case that you present, um, which certainly happens. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think the worst thing I could do would be to make promises um, to them that I can't keep and be to try to fill my plate with things that are, are beyond the scope of what my job is. Um, and I think that we have to have boundaries for ourselves. And Afghanistan was certainly a place that tests those boundaries, but but you have to have boundaries, otherwise you will draw. How has being a war correspondent changed your own beliefs and perspectives? I mean, going from these war zones to the U.S. or back to Australia, and then kind of seeing these first world problems where we have kind of a more political divide on both the left and the right, you know, kind of squabbling over, in comparison, pretty minute things. I mean, it has to be, you know, definitely has to be hard to probably have some conversations with folks back home or I never want to be that person who thinks that my work is holier than now and that uh, you know only what I do is important I think what everybody goes through is important everybody's going through their own um, difficulties and struggles and and you know I never I would never be someone who just misses that and so I think it's important again to, to come back and to recognize that you have to toggle these two worlds um, and I, I appreciate sometimes coming back and listening to people's, you know, very first world problems, um, because it does remind me that, you know, there is, um, that, that, that's a luxury in itself in many ways. And that is something I think the U S through its own war and its own, um, struggles and, and certainly in perfect place. But I think it's something that the U S has earned in many ways, um, is this sort of relative sense of peace. Um, and I don't think that, I think that should be something that's appreciated, not dismissed. Um, but, I, you know, I do find the sort of the political posturing on both sides to be a little bit sort of a, I just kind of look at it like theatre, really. It's, it's sort of like Hollywood to me. I don't know how much it, you know, if it's something that's really going to affect me, then I'll pay attention to it. But if it's something that's sort of just, um, you know, to sort of stir up drama and, and to waste more taxpayer dollars. And I usually just find it easy just to, to not sort of engage or um, waste my time kind of discussing it or immersing myself in it. But I think that, um, but yeah, I think that we definitely can't lose sight of, of, um, of being aware of all these things that happen overseas, but also, you know, coming back and, and just trying to be a normal person too. I, I can't be, um, bringing my own baggage into to lives here because lives are very different. And I think that is a, is a very beautiful thing in itself. I kind of do want to go back to your travels and in, in, in Afghanistan. I think you once told me a story that, that you were captured, right? You were with the Taliban. Can you walk us through being detained by the Taliban? And then um, how do you, how'd you get through it? Yeah, I mean, it's happened a few times. So my last trip there in September, October of this year, um, I was detained. Um, I was in Hosta. It's a province in the south, and they have these big tunnels that Osama bin Laden and the Haqqanis built in the 90s, and that was what they were used to send suicide bombers into Pakistan. Um, and I had permission to be there. I had letters, you know, all the things that I needed to get. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, and I went down there, and, of course, these sort of low-level talibs in the area um, you know, came and they thought my Fitbit was a spy camera and it turned into this thing. And, and so they detained me and I was annoyed because they took my phone and my passport and everything that I had on me and, and my Fitbit and they broke it. So I was annoyed about that. But at the same time, I, um, I, I just, I, I guess I, the only thing you can do to get through it is to stay calm and recognize it will be resolved. Um, I'm not a spy. I'm not there doing anything illegally and just hope that eventually uh, the right person can come and vouch for you. And that was a little bit difficult because there was no cell signal in the area that we were. And so they sort of kept moving me around to different places. And, and um, it was just kind of an, you know, it was frustrating more than anything because of, you know, my work and the things that I needed to do. And yet here I being moved from truck to truck. Um, and that was, the, you know, it's unpleasant having your, all your things taken off you. Um, but the person actually, ironically enough, that came to, to my defense, who I'd met with el earlier that day before I was detained, and he was the governor of Host, and his name is Mohammed Amari. And when he found out that I was being detained, he was very upset, you know, where um, the Taliban have this concept of Pashtunwali, you know, guest in the country. 
and and he's very upset and you know telling them they need to give me food and water and a room and all this sort of thing and i was just like you just need to let me go i need to get back to Kabul. um but anyway muhammad armory was actually one of the gitmo five so he was one of the five uh guantanamo bay detainees he was traded for Bo Bogdal, who was uh, captured by the Taliban and, and held for a number of years uh, by the Haqqani Network. Um, and the U.S. orchestrated under Obama, organize, orchestrated an exchange to get Bogdal back. They would um, free five of these Gitmo, um, uh, you know, suspect terrorists. And that was one of them was Mohammed Amri, and he was there for 13 years. So anyway, it was just bizarre that he was this guy that was sort of coming to my defense and um, and it all got resolved in the end and I got detained again a few days later for something else. But it's something you just have to ex not accept, well, not accept because I don't know too many journalists that have actually been detained, seems to be my luck. You just have to, again, know that you choosing to be in this situation. Nobody is forcing you to be in this situation. Um, unlike local people who, you know, get rolled up all the time, um, I have a choice to be in or out, and I'm choosing at that time to be in there. And and I have to accept that and take responsibility for that too. And um, and just sort of focus and be very pragmatic. Again, you can't be emotional. You can't be up, you know, upset. You you have to just be pragmatic and figuring out what is the best way to kind of navigate the situation and get out of it. Um, if you start sort of going down a rabbit hole of of, of emotions, then um, it's certainly not going to to help you in that way. Wow. Yeah. So how how was how long was that detention that I can't remember. Maybe it's like 12 hours. So it was like an overnight and then out. In yeah. Early Gosh, next that's day. long enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's long enough. That's, that's long enough. <laughs> and at least they didn't like, um, yeah. They did ever give you back your things and um, your passport. They did. They gave me back all my things and they, they went give through it my notebook, which I found very violating. Um, the, one of the Intel guys did it yeah. in front of me. He sat there and like went through it and I found that violating. I don't know, more than anything else. Yeah. Just because that's my notebook, I write personal notes yeah. in there. I write thoughts in yeah. there, and um, and he he seemed very entertaining going through my notebook. So anyway, and I'd also just been on a, a trip, I think, to Israel before that. So I was uh, glad he didn't really pick up too much of that in the notebook because that could have been another problem in itself. Um, but they did give me my stuff back, but the Fitbit, you know, never worked again after that. So I don't know what they did to it, but. They're easy to replace. It's the passport and the phone and the bank cards and everything else that is in my phone that <laughs> I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's important to get back. Do you find your mind kind of like scrolling through thoughts that like something really, really bad could happen to me here? And how do you, your parents you also do? I mean, you certainly have to be aware of when or what you're walking into and, and you have to have a good sort of situational awareness. Um, but I think, you know, you can't get too. Uh, caught up in all of that too and I think again it's a perfectly normal um it's a perfectly normal response for 99 percent of the population to have that sort of intense fear and think I will have none of that um and that's why it's you know it's a sort of a small group of people who do the work you have to recognize that you can get hurt but you have to be able to um you know trust your intuition and believe in the work that you're doing um is important and there um that you have to be able to sort of uh work through that and um I think, you know, of all the people living on the ground in a lot of these places, you know, my, I'm not necessarily more important than they are. So, um, you know, you have to be very sort of humble in, in kind of going into that. And, and I just remind myself that there are millions of other locals still living on the ground, you know, that have been living there for X years. And, um, and you know, why am I sort of going to be coddled more than them? Um, so I, I just think you have to have a healthy dose of fear. I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody sort of just going to a war zone for fun. Um, but you have to not let that kind of impact your work. But, but yeah, there are certainly um, times when you uh, uh, your nerves are completely shot or, um, it, you know, it does become very unpleasant. Um, I think that really, honestly, there's nothing fun about being under bombardment for extended periods of time. I think um, there's a, a misnomer a little bit that people always talk about, oh, it's the adrenaline and, and whatever else. And um, I'm sure, that, you know, there's a, certainly a, a big relief that comes once you've survived that day or, you know, once you, if you've, you know, in my last trip to Ukraine in the East, it was it was incredibly intense, and there's certainly this 
um, sort of relief when you sort of get out of that really dark zone and into a little bit of a safe area and you can kind of um, yeah, sigh a bit of relief and, 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 but there isn't this sort of, uh, in, at least in my experience, there isn't this sort of crazy high that, you know, people talk about and you're addicted to the adrenaline and I, I always kind of find that annoying and um, because it's just, in my case, it's, it's not, it's just not accurate. And I, I hear that all the time from people. I was out the other night um, with some friends, oh, you're addicted to the adrenaline. I was like, you, no, I'm not. <laughs> like, there's much more to it than that. Um, there, if I was addicted to adrenaline, there are way more easy, cheaper ways to kind of go and get a fix. It's about, um, you know, wanting to do the work. And again, it's, I think people are always telling me that, Oh, it's not something you can do forever, you know, you, you're going to get burned out, you're going to give it up, but I certainly haven't reached that point yet. And I I don't know if I ever will. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But, you know, definitely for now, I, I really do love what I do. And you're very good at it. So like the combo Thank of you. having it be a passion and, and loving it, I think it's probably what keeps you coming back. I mean, yeah, you can go do anything, but um, yeah, it's it's just so so fascinating for us um, who doesn't see what you see, you know? And so we're kind of like starstruck in a sense, but, um, you know, there's sometimes you've mentioned, I think, in some interviews that we've seen, um, that sometimes you have embedded with the U S military when you go there. And then sometimes you do it alone. What's the difference or in protocol when you do embed with the military and does that affect your storytelling at all? Um, I think for the most part, I always do it alone. Um, only every now and then, really, if I think the audience is, uh, is sort of keen to get that different point of view, then I'll do an embed. Being independent, you can do what you want, go where you want, um, interview who you want. You know, there are sort of no restrictions. I'm not a government employee. Nobody can kind of tell me what I can and can't do. Um, and then I think when you are in an embed, you know, it's obviously much more of a structured environment. Um, you've got to be told to, you know, wear the vest and helmet or we're going here or, you know, it's just more structured. It's not censored. It's, it's, um, it's just structured, I think. And, and, um, you know, I'm sure the U.S. military has the stories they want and the stories that they don't. But, you know, in my experience and, and you know, to their credit, I've never sort of been, you know, words have never been put into my mouth or I've never been, um, I've never felt that my, what I was asking was being manipulated or that there was sort of a, mm -hmm. an agenda behind it all. I've always felt very much in control of the story that I'm telling. And, um, and I think, you know, in the U.S. that is certainly something um, is the value of, of free speech. And, and I think that is, um, you know, I, I've heard plenty of horror stories of different embeds, um, especially throughout the early Iraq Afghanistan days with journalists. But I think in, you know, speaking from my own experience, um, the DOG has always been, and the State Department have always been fairly, um, you know, good about sort of not. Um, Do they also like have to escort you everywhere? when you work when you do an embed uh pre i mean pretty much no, no. i mean there's again it's really place by place but but there are yeah definitely you know, it's like safety protocols especially yeah. journalists and yeah they um like in guantanamo bay they make you wear like a press thing all the time and even when you aren't being escorted i mean there's certain places that they have to escort you in but then if you know you want to go to the restaurant or something at night um you can go alone but that's where a press badge is basically just kind of uh, um, a warning to everyone else on the base not to come and talk to you. So there are little things like that. Yeah, it's it's just interesting kind of getting a window through this world. I, I can ask you more questions like forever. <laughs> you know, there's always so many topics. We'll do a part two. Um, we should do a part two. Do you want to? Like, oh, my God, that would be great. Let's do I've it. I always thought about like doing something at the beach, you know, like right, right yeah. up front. And by the, there's a grassy area and we have these you know, dynamic mics that hopefully will only pick That's up our cool. vocals and not so much the noise, but uh, I do hope you studio. can come. The beach studio. Yeah. What would be your uh, final thoughts and just your, you know, your message that you'd like to share? I think it's just important that we, we keep listening and we keep engaging with each other. And I think, um, you know, war is a place that you see the best and you see the worst in people. And, um, you know, it's these sort of, I think, dynamics that really interest me the most. But 
Um, but you do see, you see extraordinary acts of, of kindness of people helping strangers and uh, people really coming together. And I just think, um, you know, how much nicer that would be if we could apply some of those things to our everyday life. And I think that we, we don't realize how much impact we can have on other people that are around us um, with a little bit of, you know, just kind of care and kindness and a smile. And as cheesy as that sounds, those things really do matter. And um, yeah, I just think there's so much brutality in the world. I think it would, um, you know, behoove all of us to, to take a little bit of a step back and just to, I think, pick and choose our battles in life a little bit more and um and recognize when we are saying something or doing something that is sort of um not necessary and and just all trying to be better people yeah i love that gosh thank you so much sister for being here with us today i uh we definitely can't wait to do uh a part two we're actually in the same room so i keep looking over there but um, uh yeah i can't wait to do a part two and um i hope we can do it in person and we'd see uh one another uh very soon um i just uh, i send you so much love and everything that you do and uh thank you for doing uh, what you do and sharing these stories. Thank with you. Us. And thank you to you for both of you for all your love and support and friendship. And um, it's just, it's really valued. So thank you. Awesome. Well, my friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe on YouTube and hit the notification bell. Also, if you received any value from this episode, please hit the like button. It definitely helps us uh, in the algorithm and be found. Also, find our podcast on Spotify and wherever you download your podcast from. We're going to link in the description below um, the link to Holly's book, Only Cry for the Living. Be sure to pick it up. Uh, we're also going to list her sub stack that you can subscribe to and uh, you can see all her articles there and her work. Really incredible body of work, by the way, and, and her social media as well will be all in the description. We thank you all for watching and we will see you on the next episode.